Today is, is a great pleasure for me and, and I'm sure for everyone here. Um, uh, Whitney Sanford is going to be presenting uh, her topic on why we need religion to solve the world food crisis. So it makes that bridge. But the bridge that I have with Whitney starts earlier. And I'm going to sort of depart from the bio sketch here because it's, it's very well done and it has a lot of important details, but there are other details which started in Philadelphia um, in the uh, mid-1980s when Whitney was there doing her PhD dissertation uh, and uh, at the University of Pennsylvania where I teach. And we discovered an interesting overlap with Iris. Um, when I became master of one of the college houses at Penn, the uh, Ware College House, there was the Health and Society College House, and, and I naturally came into contact with a lot more of the faculty at the university because of that. And one of them was Guy Welbin. And Guy Welbin turned out to be her advisor for her dissertation, who was in the religion department. And he came to me and said, you know, with my interest in religion and science, what could, what could they do to perhaps make a bridge that would involve all the things we were doing in health and society? And so I uh, uh, suggested a name to him that I thought would be a brilliant person for, for a series of lectures that the university would sponsor. Uh, and uh, his name was John Bowker. And uh -huh. John Bowker, of course, uh -huh. is one of the great uh, uh, people that, that helped transform Iris in the 80s and, and early, uh, well, really throughout the 80s and late 70s. Uh, and he's still a member of Iris and still is. Uh, uh, he lives in, in Cambridge, uh, England. But the point is that that helped stimulate some other thinking. And now, uh, Whitney has another connection with us. The, the two Whitneys, um, uh, Whitney Sanford and Whitney Bauman, it turns out they co-chaired, and I didn't know this until talking with Whitney about it, that they co-chaired um, the uh, AAR Religion and Ecology um, uh, Division. So. It's really a great pleasure to have all those connections now come home. And Whitney, this is her first time giving, visiting an IRIS meeting and, of course, providing this, uh, uh, this important plenary session. So I want you all to give her a big hand as, as we introduce her to have her come up. point out the difference. Uh, I'm girl with you. He was boy with you. <laughs> confused. Um, so anyway, um, basically what I just to start off, I want to say wow. Because we have heard so much amazing information over this, this whole week um, about people have laid out the problems and the issues with the global food crisis about waste and about nutrition and about obesity. So uh, let me just say wow in response to all that and comment that I have a, a great challenge here to talk about how do we bring religion to this. Um, and so that I think it's a, it's a huge challenge and one we're going to try to meet this, this morning. And one of the things I'm going to do as we, we talk about this, we've heard a lot about the problems in Africa and in India, some in the US, in various places. But in my talk today, I want to focus a little more about those of us in, in say, the global north or in, in North America, because I think we are both the problem and the solution. So most of what my talk today is going to be focusing on how do we respond to these problems? Like, what do we do as individuals, as community, and as a uh, as a body politic? Um, so it's, it's okay. Okay. There Silence. Um, so, just just imagine yourself. Picture yourself in a uh, walking through a typical supermarket in the U.S. You know, whether that's a Publix, a Kroger, a Pathmark. I don't even know if AMPs exist anymore. And you know, imagine piles of, of unblemished fruits and vegetables. We saw lots of piles of, of really good fruits and vegetables in Steve's talk last night. Fully stocked trays of sushi, even at midnight. And then even just imagine the chip aisle, like how many flavors of Doritos and pretzels, pretzels are there now. Um, and all of these millions of flavors of Doritos and pretzels are, uh, you know, they're, they're laid out to give us the idea that, um, that we have choice and uh, choice and illusion in our, in our food supply. 
Um, uh, but these, these overflowing shelves and these pristine aisles of our grocery stores, they, uh, they, oh, they belie an uncomfortable reality. That in fact, we are in the midst of a uh, global food crisis um, that are in our choices and that, that face us. The choices, and that is us, I'm talking about we as in residents of the global north, um, our choices about what we eat and how we grow our, how we grow our food, they're not sustainable, nor are they equitable. Okay, so um, let me just define a little bit the global north and global south. You can see, um, you probably know this, you've heard about it for the last five days, but I want to add a little to this definition. Um, the countries in red tend to be seen as the global yeah. south, and the things up in the north tend to be seen as the, uh, the, global, the global north. And I want to add a little to that because generally these are seen as geographic designations, but I think it's a little more complicated than that, in that, say, in the United States, we have aspects of the global south. So, for example, in, if you want to think about north and south in terms of access to resources, um, parts of, say, the rural south or, say, native reservations might constitute the global south within the United States. And I think, part, say, pockets of Delhi, like Khan Market, which is near some of the wealth, the, the embassy area in Delhi, there's certainly a lot of the global north in that. So it's, it's generally geographic, but not entirely that's so when I refer to things like global north, global south. Let's keep that, um, let's keep that in mind. Um, so basically, how do we feed a hungry world in a manner that is sustainable and just for all members of the Biden community? That means human members and non-human members. And what special resources do the world's religious traditions bring to the table? Let me step back here a little bit and talk about what I do as a religion professor. So I'm a professor in uh, the Department of Religion at University of Florida. So we're, we are a large state school. Um, I, I approach, as do many of my colleagues, we approach the study of religion from an academic viewpoint. Many of us are trained in looking at religion from areas such as the sociology of religion, from the history of religion. I was trained as an historian of religion. And the way I ask questions about different religious traditions, I generally look at other texts or I do ethnographic field work, which is a sort of a glorified way of saying I hang out with people and ask questions and sort of participate in whatever they're doing at the time. And more specifically, a part of a newer field that's called religion and nature or religion and ecology. And what this means is um, we, we look at two things primarily. One, we look at what do the different world's religious traditions have to say about the natural world? So how does nature fit into religious traditions, and how do these traditions talk about the relationship between humans and the natural world? And then I'd say a little bit more recently, people, we've also started talking about how do different religious traditions, how are we responding to environmental crises, whether that's water issues, food, climate change, for example, what resources, or what, how are different traditions responding uh, to, to these, these newer crises? And one more thing I'll say too is, as a religious studies professional, when we talk about religion, we're very broad in our approach to religion. So while we talk certainly about the historical traditions, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, for example, we also look at a lot of behaviors as religious. So one of my colleagues that I spoke last year, Ron Taylor, he looks at environmentalism as religious behavior. So just put that broadly, we're very broad in how we look at the term of the <coughs> definition of religion. So religion. So of course economists, policymakers, agronomists, among others, you know, all these groups have made significant, significant contributions to addressing the food crisis. And very few approaches have, have incorporated perspectives from the world's religious traditions. Yet fundamentally, the food crisis is a moral crisis. Eating is a moral act and our food choices, whether or not they're passive, they're votes for a particular food system. We basically, there we go. Um, we basically vote with our fork. And one thing I want to point out about this, I'll come back to this later, but this vote with your fork sign is, this largely presumes individual behavior. For example, I know I could change the food system with my individual behavior, but I want to also just remind everyone that how much our tax dollars subsidize the food system that we have. So even though it might be, you might want to think, okay, I can change the system with what I choose, say over in that dining hall over there. Regardless of what choice you make, we're also all of us are subsidizing whole ranges of behaviors we may not agree with with our with our tax dollars and our subsidies of corporations. People addressed that um, earlier. So basically, our, our current food system it's broken. The cost to humans, animals, and the environment it's no longer bearable. We've got to move beyond the mantra of feeding the world, in which feeding millions, 
or feeding the world is justification for systemic violence in virtually all aspects of food production. Since this is a moral problem, techno technological fixes by themselves will not solve the food crisis. And here's where religious perspectives can help us. Um, so in what follows, I'm going, to sh I'm going to show how religious or faith-based perspectives provide alternative criteria to both evaluate the food we eat and how it's produced, and also change policies and behaviors at multiple scales, for example, the individual, at the community, and at the body, body politic. So what, what this means is we need to question or interrogate the social and environmental effects of food production. Who benefits from our food system? And who or what loses? And further, these religious perspectives typically emphasize the dignity and the sanctity of all creation and all beings. And I realize that is how, how that is written and how sometimes these things are affected can be quite different. So that probably is a conversation in and of itself. So in this talk, specifically, I'm going to, I'm going to emphasize three points. So first, I'm going to explore the, con the uh, concept of agricultural relations, the notion that food and agriculture are embedded in networks of relations. This concept of relationship leads us to questions about the costs and benefits of different practices and questions about our relations with other beings, for example, the rest of the body community and other people. Second, what metaphors or what language structures how we think about our relations with the earth? So do we think of agriculture as a war on nature, something we have to tame and control and beat down? Or do we think about agriculture as a cooperative venture? Can we work with the natural world to produce food and create bio biodiversity, for example? kind of thought process we see in things like agroecology. Third, religious perspectives can help us accept limits to our wants and our desires. Those of us in the global north must limit our consumption, and that's difficult in our consumer society. Religious and faith-based perspectives offer holistic frameworks that integrate what are often called the three legs of sustainability, that is equity, social equity, the economic leg, and also environmental, environmental concerns. Focusing on relationships and evaluating the quality of our multiple relationships to humans, creatures, and the rest of the earth can help us enhance our ecological or agricultural imaginations. Then we can imagine and create new scientific, economic, and social approaches to the global food crisis. And more importantly, we can fashion systems that establish and support right relations among all beings. And finally, to bring this narrative into the realm of practice, actually, what do we do? I'm going to focus for a few minutes on a specific set of intentional communities in the United States that are demonstrating that alternative life and food ways are not only possible, but fulfilling. And that answers some of these values to practice. And how do we actually do what it is we say we believe? So, the global food crisis. Yep. Um, so I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail because we've heard about it again for this week, but just suffice to say that authors such as Michael um, Michael Pollan, um, Anna and Francis Moore LePay, um, Mark Bittman have popularized food concerns around the United States. <laughs> so I heard these guys practicing their chants this morning. I was afraid I was going to give my entire talk in a three beat. Remember, eat well, eat well. Um, <laughs> Dirt, King Corn, um, and Food Inc., some of which we saw this week. I couldn't, I couldn't stay up that late, but I, I think some of the real diehards were able to stay up late enough for these movies. Um, now they're screened in popular theaters, environmental film festivals, and classrooms. So the American public is a lot more familiar with food issues than they were, say, 10 years ago. So I find at conferences, for example, now, if I say I'm working in food and religion or food and agriculture, people say, oh, yeah, as opposed to even like five years ago, people look either blank. Or said, what do those two? You know, what those? What could those things possibly have to do with each other? So, um, so it's, it's much more popularized. And suffice it to say, the food crisis extends into multiple arenas. So, a large portion of the, the world's population, as we've heard from this week, is either stuffed and starved to adopt the, the title of Roger Patel's book. Problems of hunger, malnutrition, and obesity are rampant all at once. They're across the globe, and providing the world's population with affordable, nutritious, and safe food is becoming increasingly difficult. The FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN, has projected that we'll need 70% 70 70 more food by 2050, and these estimates could possibly go up as more consumers around the world demand a first world and meat-heavy diet, regardless of whether we actually think that's a good idea. Yep. Um, and our default 
today our default uh, agricultural system is one of industrial agriculture. And in response to that, in a talk on resilience, Fred Kirschman of the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture, he's at Iowa State University, he identifies four major threats to industrial agriculture. Industrial constraints, so for example, do we have enough energy to keep doing this? Water shortage, we've heard about that. Climate change and environmental degradation. And so we've assumed up until now that scientific and technological ingenuity will help us solve these problems. We'll just invent a, a new machine, a new seed, a new you know, process, something or other. But hunger, environmental degradation, abuse of farm animals, and over-reliance on fossil fuels, these are failures of vision and will. And technological fixes simply aren't enough. So what we need are new questions, new metaphors, and new stories. And so I'll address, the first perspective I'll address, is relationality or kinship. So what if we look at the global food crisis through the lens of relationships? All religious traditions address relationships in some capacity. For example, most religions offer models for our relations with the divine, our relations with each other, with the human beings, for example, and our relations with the earth. And so while different religious traditions conceptualize these things differently, <laughs> most traditions portray some variation of the concept of right relations. Um, that, is, that is compassionate and sustaining relations between the divine humans and the biotic community. So in my book, Growing Stories, Religion and the Fate of Agriculture, I argue that agriculture, and by extension food, is inherently relational. We grow food in relation with the earth and the soil, and eating is deeply rooted in our social, ethical, and religious lives. We can choose how, how we want to enact these relations, and we can choose our guiding metaphors, domination or cooperation. Should we farm with harsh chemicals that rob the soil of its fertility and future generations of their livelihood? Does our growing demand for cheap meat inflict suffering on animals? Or, on the other hand, can we turn to Wes Jackson's ecosystem-based agriculture that grew, grows food alongside and not op in opposition to natural processes? Consulting the genius of the place, as Jackson phrased it. The food crisis port portrays a series of broken relations between humans, divinity, and the earth. The lens of relationship, as, understand, as understood by the world's different traditions, it offers a frame for us to think about how we consider our food and, and how our agricultural practices affect others, human and non-human. Are our practices exploitive or compassionate, for example? What kind of role do we want to play in relationship to the earth and to other humans? So what kind of actors do we want to be? So I want to take a second just to depart onto the realm of agrarian thought. Um, in, in how agrarian thought and agriculture fits in terms of environmental, relation, environmental studies and environmental ethics. Because until quite recently, both environmental ethics and environmental thought have tended to neglect agriculture. So as I, as I just pointed out, agriculture is inherently relational. That is, we work with the earth and intervene in the processes of the earth to produce food. Most, most environmental thought, although this is beginning to change, is focused on preserving wilderness and iconic species, such as elephants and polar bears, or even you know, beautiful landscapes like, like the Rockies. So farmland and pigs just haven't had the same appeal. And so I think that... Uh, <laughs> 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 I feel like I like <laughs> um, So I, I think we can all look at this and kind of laugh. You know, I've got a Sierra Club desk calendar, and every, you know, every day I look at this thing and I see these beautiful places where I want to go on vacation. Like I can see this lake being on my Sierra Club desk calendar. And that's the kind of thing many of us are instinctively called to protect. protect. And we tend to ignore you know, the farmlands, the pigs, and, and even earthworms, for example. We just don't think about those kind of things. Um, and I think one of the idea, one of the reasons that we tended to ignore some of the agricultural lands is we, you know, they, they have the idea, they seem to be used or tainted for, for some reason. We often want to focus on these, the notion of pristine wilderness, for example, something that has never been touched, an idea which really is highly questionable in and of itself. But in terms of our agricultural relations, we really not focus much on lands that we actually use. And that's an enormous problem because agriculture is causing enormous, um, it, it, it's, it's hugely damaging to water systems, to, to land systems. So it's really something we need to be focusing, focusing on. Dana Jackson, who's actually a, the, uh, the daughter of the ex-wife of Wes Jackson, noted that um, the Midwest has become an ecological sacrifice zone. So in order to protect some of the iconic landscapes, we basically you know, sacrifice the Midwest 
let it be, you know, let all the land be destroyed, for example, ignore problems of soil erosion, loss of water, soil contamination. Those are compromises necessary to uh, to feed the world. Um, and so I, I, I will say that groups like the Conservation um, Society, uh, Sierra Club, they're starting to focus more on food issues and agricultural lands, but it's, it's been kind of a long time in, in coming. So one of our questions we need to think about is, you know, how, is, how do we use the land? Not simply how do we protect or conserve it, but how do we actually uh, use it? So considering our agricultural practices or our interventions into the land offers us a huge opportunity to choose how we want to interact with the land, how do we want to work with it. Conservation or preservation can simply mean leaving the land alone, just ignoring it, letting it be, or using it um, very lightly, so exemplified in things like uh, leave no trace, which is, uh, which is sort of the ethos of many backpackers do. You leave the land as you found it. However, agriculture or even gardening, though, requires a certain amount of intimacy or responsiveness to the demands of the partner. So as a gardener, I can't simply impose my will on my garden. So think about it with a language of tending a garden you, uh, you care for. It. And for anyone who you, here gardens, you really know, can't make your garden do anything. Um, <laughs> I can try, but I don't need to brought that up. I thought you had it down pat. Like, it, it's actually hard work. You have to care for it. You have to sort of listen to what it tells you, not what you want it to do. You're going to be really hungry and kind of angry if you, if you do that. Um, so, you know, I, I do want my, my uh, garden to produce food, but I also have to think about, you know, what sort of garden, what sort of gardener do I want to be? Um, my relationships with my garden, or even more broadly, my relationships with food, they're embedded in a series of relationships, including relationships with other people near and far. So how we produce our food and our, and our choices um, about the foods we consume, these reflect the quality of our relationship with others. And so religious and faith-based perspectives provide models, um, provide models to, uh, to consider our relations with other beings in a holistic manner. And in one sense, a holistic approach would mean recognizing the broader effects of our food production systems on human and animals. We've heard a lot about holistic systems this week. Agrarian thinkers such as Wendell Berry, Fred Kirshenman, and even more recently, Norm Wiersbach have made us aware of the social consequences of contemporary food production, such as the rural depopulation in the U.S. Midwest and the massive loss of topsoil in the Midwest, which is going to create a huge problem for us in the, in the coming years. So in response, they asked us to think about our agricultural relations holistically, to move beyond profit and yield. So for example, our high yields resulting in less hunger. We, we certainly haven't seen evidence for that. Um, do, do high yields or some of our practices increase soil salinity and make it later more difficult to grow food? And really, where does all that food grow? So theologian John Cobb suggested that we focus on something called planetism, or reverence for the earth, rather than economism, which, is our, which reflects our current obsession with productivity and consumption. These Christian-oriented these Christian agrarian thinkers, they're echoed by voices from multiple traditions. So it's not that these come from a broad range. Winona LaDuke, who's an Ojibwe activist from the White Earth Reservation in Minnesota, she argues that the corporate control of food production as seed has severed the religious, nutritional, and agricultural relations associated with harvesting wild rice. So she specifically talked about how um, companies in California, we saw, we saw biopiracy, we've heard about biopiracy this week, she talked specifically about how companies in California have basically taken wild, wild rice production and marketed them with images of Indian, Indians, um, Native Americans, basically stealing both the, the biological and the cultural birthright of, of these people and bringing it into a much more corporate, uh, corporate world. Um, similarly, Vandana Shiva from India warns us of the devastating consequences when farmers use the cultural capital and indigenous knowledge associated with small-scale agriculture. Um, so again, this gets back to some of the talk we've had about bio biodiversity and biopiracy. But all of these all of these writers, all of them claim that the industrial model of agriculture is broken and leads to increased hunger and environmental devastation. And despite the fact that they're representing many different religious traditions, they're united in their call for they're united in their call for a holistic approach for food production and renewed efforts to, to repair and fix our agricultural relations. So I want to explore the concept of agricultural relationality a little bit more deeply to see how it might help us approach the global food crisis. And although we can easily see 
a, a number of commonalities between different religious traditions, compassion towards animals, for example, there's also considerable variation in how these different religious traditions understand and conceptualize relationships between humans, the earth, and the divine. And so to look a little more deeply into this, con into this concept, I'm going to look specifically at Buddhism and Christianity as examples to see how they might suggest different models and practices for us to think about and embrace new questions about how we think about food and agriculture and how we do this. So on the Abrahamic traditions, Christians, as well as Jews and Muslims, have typically drawn on concepts of stewardships to determine how best humans should act upon the earth. The Abrahamic traditions proclaim a deity who created the earth and all beings. In these traditions, humans have been tasked with stewardship, responsibility, caring for the earth, and all of the beings on the earth. So what does it mean to be a steward? Again, does it mean dominating the earth, or does it mean benevolence? And that, the question of stewardship, there's been a lot of spilled ink on that question, and that is not exactly my field, but so I will not be able to argue that, but I won't go much more into that. Um, the biblical tradition establishes a hierarchy from God down to the lowliest of creatures, and there's been much debate about human how human beings should fulfill this role. In 1967, Lynn White published an article that probably a lot of you all have heard about, and it's called The Historic Roots of Ecological Crisis. And in this article, he, he argued that historically, stewardship has been interpreted, or at least enacted, as a kind of domination, with little regard for the well-being of other creatures. And so in this article, he basically blamed Christianity, primarily Christianity, but I would say all the Abrahamic uh, religions, for this attitude that you know, we have a right to the earth. We can take what we want out of it, we can dominate it, um, and it, you know, basically everything there is ours, ours for the taking. And this article, published in 1967, as you might imagine, it provoked a lot of different responses, um, some in anger, some trying to change things, some trying to actually challenge and make changes. And I think, to some degree, that article and all the responses provided the, uh, the impetus for the development of my field in religion and ecology. So I think I could probably thank Lynn White for my job that I have, uh, have today. It's a very highly provocative article. Um, and so again, lots of, lots of spilled ink on that particular issue. In a subsequent and actually much later article, Wendell Berry wrote an article called, in the RI magazine, called Christianity and the Survival of Creation. And in this article that was a little bit different, he also excoriated Christians for abusing the earth. He stated that, and this is a quote, Christian organizations to this day remain largely indifferent to the rape and plunder of the world and its, and its traditional cultures. However, he also added, any, any anti-Christian you know, environmentalists who are blaming Christianity and also some Christians, they should actually start reading the Bible and not just criticizing it. Because the Bible contains many, many passages affirming both the value of creation and our responsibility to maintain God's gift. So it basically says, you know, if you can't, if you look at the Bible and you can't find, you know, find environmental themes in there, particularly agrarian themes, and you're basically not reading it very well or really missing something. And so you know, this, this kind of dialogue has prompted a lot of people to go back and look at some of these earlier texts and think about you know, what, are these, what do these texts and traditions say about what we, how we should respond to, to, the, to the crisis. And so even today, many evangelicals have embraced creation care, the idea that humans have responsibility to care for all of God's creation, and that to wantonly harm the earth is disrespectful to God, is basically sinful. So human beings, we have responsibility. God, God who created all this for us, we can't just destroy it, we can't just trap it, trash it. We have a responsibility. And just you know, more recently, um, I spent a number of years living in Iowa, and when I was there, I heard a lot of different farmers talking about, talking about their farming practices in the context of stewardship of both the land and the fact that they had a responsibility to help and care for animals as well as other, other people. In his re more recent book, um, a theology of Eating, Norman Wiersbaugh describes gardens, back to the garden theme, as microcosms of a complex array of a relationship, of relationships that join us to the soil and water and to creatures and God, relationships that nurture and have feeding and nurture at their root. And he writes an extended meditation on this. And in this, he places humans, food, and gardens as members in creation and community. And he declares that to draw life from the garden, we must also serve it and serve others. So service, humility, and responsibility lead to self-sacrifice, that is putting the needs of others ahead of our own. 
And so later on in this talk, I'm going to return to these concepts, but the language and the practice of self-sacrifice and self-discipline can help us address the challenges of both dealing with limits and self-denial, this is saying no. So for example, can I say no to when my food choices unnecessarily harm animals or deprive others, others of food? So who remembers just say no? Um, so now, on to Buddhism. Let's look at the Buddhist tradition. I, I, I'm looking at Buddhism primarily because many North Americans are, are at least somewhat familiar with basic Buddhist concepts, and also because basic Buddhist concepts about the relations between humans, divine beings, and animals differ pretty drastically from Christian views. So we've got an opposite pole here. Um, the Buddhist practice also provides resources to help us deal with desire and the frustration of limits, that is, we can't have everything we want. And so unlike Christian theology, which postulates a hierarchical structure between the creator and creation and within created beings, Buddhist thought depicts a cosmology in which all existence, including deities, are interdependent and existentially not different from each other. So fundamentally within Buddhist thought, there's no difference between anything. Any kind of any kind of differences you imagine between you know, eat the, you know us and others, between us and the world, us and created beings, though that's an illusion. You're wrong. If you think those things are there, you are flat out wrong, because they're not there. So that's according to Buddhist cosmology. <coughs> Qualities that comprise who I am at any given moment, for example, my body, my thoughts, my personhood, for example, they're transitory. These are illusions. So think about yourself as, as a child. Think about yourself when you're five years old. What, what's continuous? You probably have like maybe one or two cells that are still there. So the body itself is a great example for the constant changing within Buddhist thought that were really fundamentally different at, at all times. So the, the, and these are the, this is the basic state of human existence, impermanent, impermanence and change. These are the fundamental states of all existence. And one of the main causes of suffering, the fact that we want things to stay the same. We get upset with change. So we, we suffer um, because of this, our desire for things to stay the same. And so knowledge of this existential condition that things are always changing, and we suffer if we don't go along with this. This is the first step to liberation from suffering, and it comprises one wing of the Buddhist tradition. And so and compassion for ourselves and for the suffering of all beings comprises the other wing. So I'd say the knowledge of impermanence and knowledge of what constitutes suffering is one wing, and compassion for all beings comprises the other wing. And just to quote the Dalai Lama here, the whole purpose of religion is to facilitate love and compassion, patience, tolerance, humility, and forgiveness. So how do impermanence, interdependence, and compassion lead us towards a food act? Compassion, compassion for all beings seems obvious. Our human capabilities that have given us the capacity for harm and, harm and destruction, they also demand that we act to relieve the sufferings Sufferings of others. We'll kind of couple behind there. Um, in addition, in addition to this, uh, Buddhist concepts of impermanence and interdependence—they also erase meaningful distinctions between beings, myself and others. So David Suzuki, geneticist. Um, David Suzuki, who's a geneticist by training, environmental activist, and Buddhist, he likens interdependence or inter interdependent co-arising, which is the Buddhist philosophical term for this, to the physical cycles of decomposition and regeneration, or really re the ultimate form of recycling. He quotes his uh, now deceased father. He says, I will return to nature where I came from. I will be part of the fish, the trees, the birds. That is my reincarnation. So he thinks that you often think about reincarnation as highly metaphysical concept, but it's also a very physical concept as well. It kind of reflects earth to earth, dust to dust. But the idea within this physical process, fundamentally there's no real, ultimately there's no real distinction between us and anything else. Buddhist concepts of interdependence illustrate how our physical existence is intimately bound with ecological processes and clinging to our narrowly constructed selves, that is who I am, it causes suffering for ourselves and others. As the Buddhist nun um, Pema Chodron says, somehow, in the process of trying to deny that things are always changing, we lose our sense of the sacredness of life. We tend to forget that we're part of the natural scheme of things. So particularly in the United States and some of the Western traditions, we've, we've been very, we have a real tendency to separate ourselves out of the natural process of being. We tend to think of human as something other. We separate the biological and cultural. And what one of the resources Buddhist thought offers us is how intimately tied we are to, to natural processes. We're, we have culture, but we're still part of the biological, biological world. 
So recognizing our connections and showing com compassion to others really is a kind of form of self-defense. We need to depend on a healthy ecosystem, just as three sticks need all three in order to stand. So basically, you've got three sticks leaning together. If one collapses, everything falls. So if we don't think about our biological connections, if we don't take care of these relations, we simply can't survive. And this is a point that a number of people have made through this past week. If we don't pay attention to our food sources, how we're treating the earth in more sustainable ways, something will collapse and we simply will not be able to, will not be able to make it. Um, um, so, one more quotation here. Vietnamese monk and uh, peace activist Thich Nhat Hanh, I think probably a lot of you all are familiar with, he illustrates our interconnections and interdependence in the social, economic, and environmental realms in his poem, Please Call Me By My True Names. And I'm just going to quote a little bit of this, but in this, in this poem, um, he, he exemplifies the interconnections that, that are difficult for us to recognize, but in, within the Buddhist tradition exist. So, I am the child in Uganda, all skin and bones, my legs as thin as bamboo sticks. I am the arms merchant selling deadly weapons to Uganda. I am the 12-year-old girl, refugee on a small boat, who throws herself into the ocean after being raped by a sea pirate. And I am the pirate, not yet capable of seeing and loving. Please call me by my true names, so I can wake up and the door of my heart can be left open, the doors of compassion. Now, I think this poem is a challenge. I've used it with students in class, and you know, for me, Possibly the, the raping sea pirate is normally not one I'm typically called for uh, compassion for. Um, so, it, so it's a real challenge to recognize interconnections, but it, it does force us to recognize our, you know, all human beings, not just ours, but all human beings' complicit in it, compl complicity in a range, a range of problems. So I think this poem, it, it challenges us to have compassion for people for whom we might not normally have compassion to. So he, he illustrates how we're all complicit, and all of us are responsible for the tragedies going on in, in the earth. And so I've highlighted the, uh, these aspects of Christian and Buddhist thought to show some paradigms that might help us create new ecological imaginations and to ask new, new sorts of questions. Both the Christian and the Buddhist paradigms, they highlight compassion and responsibility for others, but they use very different conceptual frameworks. And so now I'd like to go on and consider how these holistic paradigms can lead us to new questions about our agricultural technologies and practice, practices. So the second perspective, so the first perspective, I just talked about this first perspective of relationality. Now how, how can we think about and create new alternate metaphors and paradigms? So the second perspective explores these alternate metaphors and paradigms. Frameworks that emphasize compassion and interconnectedness offers new insights to how we can and should practice and produce rather and consume food. Viewing our food systems holistically is certainly more complicated because it means how food and production systems fit within myriad systems and relations. So basically to draw a parallel, the study of ecology or ecosystems is similarly complicated because we can't simply isolate one piece of information. So we've heard particularly from Saul and others the idea of systems thinking. And so many scholars and practitioner, practitioners have critiqued the Western scientific paradigm based on Rene Descartes that view the uh, body and earth as, as machines. Um, so in this, in this view, the natural world is like a machine, and by knowing the roles and functions of the component parts, it's possible to understand how the machine works and more importantly, how to control it. So that, that kind of mechanistic thinking has under, underlied a lot of thinking. Um, David Suzuki, who I just mentioned, the, the Buddhist and geneticist, he argues that this modern view has alienated us from the world, and that abstractions and fragmented knowledge obscure the consequences of our actions. In this schema, he says, data is extracted and isolated from the situatedness and more complicated sets of relations. So for example, in food production, if the only marker for judging production of corn is the number of bushels produced per acre, its yield, that is, then we exclude a range of other markers, which, which include beneficial factors, such as, say, the fodder for animals, the impact of fertilization, fertilizers on soil and water health, and the effects of monocultures on, on uh, rural economic health. And this kind of systems thinking also reflects some of the, um, some of the newer thinking in genetics, for example, that how genes express is also related to its, its own environment. So while I think some earlier assumptions about genetics were that it was a much more mechanistic process, or at least that's how it's portrayed in 
popular in, in popular literature and the media, it's embedded much more complicated relationships of expression and uh, expression environment. So the fragmented systems of modernity do not take into account the, rela um, the relationship and the social situatedness of agriculture. So Fred Kirschman, again, he's, a, he's at the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture, he wrote an article about postmodern agriculture. And he notes that the machine metaphor forces us to overlook vital pieces of information about the world, information about relationships, interdependencies, and emergent properties, all vital, as it turns out, to our economic, social, and environmental sustainability. So changing these, these metaphoric realms, or looking using different frames, different paradigms, this opens up new questions and new possibilities in how do we understand the body, agriculture, and ecology. So for example, consider a metaphors of the body, rather than thinking of the body in, meta, um, in the mechanistic framework, think about the metaphor of an organic, organic self-regulating, or homostatic entity. The organic metaphor instead suggests that the constituents, parts, and processes of an organism operate interdependently. So for example, what you do to one part of the body affects the rest. So think about research on stress, for example. There's not, not an organ you go to for stress. It's something that you know, affects the entire body. And the fact that our, what happens to us mentally and emotionally can have huge effects on the rest of the body. Um, the organic metaphor raises questions about the relationships of various processes and their different interactions. So organic agriculture, restoration agriculture, agroecology, for example, reflect this, mu this much more homeostatic or holistic metaphor rather than mechanistic frames. And I'll just give a little quotation from Miguel Altieri, who's done a lot of research with, uh, with the field of agroecology. It says, these ag agroecological practices stress interactions between various biological and non-biological components of the system. By creating a functional biodiversity, processes occur that provide ecological services, such as the activation of soil organisms, cycling of nutrients, and the enhancements of beneficial insects and antagonists, and so on. So basically, looking at agriculture through this much more this lens of interdependence and interconnectedness, it provides us an imagine, imaginative space to explore the conditions of these relationships. That is, what are the costs and benefits of various practices and technologies? Who wins, in other words, and who loses? Focusing solely on yield, for example, does not, does not answer the question of who benefits from these yields. So we've heard a lot about, even though we may have a lot of food yield, it doesn't mean it's getting to everybody. It doesn't mean it's getting to the right people. So in a post-NAFTA world, for example, Oaxacan farmers have not benefited from the higher US yields in corn. Instead, they basically lost their livelihood. Um, and I'll invoke the name of Mohandas, or better known as Mahatma Gandhi here. He offers a useful frame to think about some of these questions. Recall the face of the poorest and weakest man um, whom you may have seen, and ask yourself if the step you contemplate is going to be of any use to him. So religion and science. Um, so these alternate frames, um, whether it's relationship, compassion, interdependence, interconnectedness, these aren't anti-science, or they're not regressions of some kind of mythic past, but they can help us ask different questions of our scientific and other sorts of research. We've been trained and persuaded to believe that intensive, chemically, and product-driven industrial agriculture is the only way, not just a way, to feed the world. Um, instead, here for another perspective, Wes Jackson's research on perennial polyculture, she's at the Land Institute in Salinas, Kansas, so he's done an enormous amount of research on perennial polycultures that mimic the prairie ecosystem and offer alter alternate and still data-driven approach. These perennial polycultures are designed to regenerate the soil into a healthy ecosystem, and they exemplify the principles of interdependence and reciprocity between humans, soil, and plants. So these qualities of interdependence, regeneration, and reciprocity, they're fundamental to alternative agriculture, such as agroecology. So agricultural ecology is good science and can be verified by data, but it's not simply a matter of belief or opinion. So GMO, one of the questions we're all, we're all interested in. Um, these new frames of interdependence and compassion, they can also help us wade through the muddy and contentious debates about agricultural technologies, such as GMOs or transgenics. Um, most of the discussion and the battles about GMOs are waged in metaphoric language that evoke the paradigmic realms in which the arguments are embedded. 
So for example, some proponents, they look at them as almost salvific. They're going to feed the world, they're, they're going to save us. And others detract of, say, playing God, for example, or runaway, runaway genes. I, I love these pictures. <laughs> you can guess which side those are. Those are fun. Um, now, some of these concerns people have, they do point to very real concerns about, about transgenics. But the language, this kind of um, overblown language, it doesn't really lead to any kind of meaningful discussion about poten potential benefits or detractions or the potential social, economic, or ecological consequences. So for example, um, farmers in groups such as Via Campesina, which you heard about earlier this week, but it's the International Peasants, Peasants Group, um, as well as some of the farmers in India that I've spoken to, they question the benefits and consequences of GMOs. So for example, while many have said that, and I hear this all the time in my institution at UF, which is a land-grant institution, that GMOs are the only way that we will be able to feed the world, some of the farmers and people in those in these countries, such as India, they cite concerns about the you know ownership of germplasm. So, for example, who will have access to the the DNA in the materials? What happens when they lose the land races that are specifically adapted to their microclimates? Can they afford the cost of the technological packets, the inputs, for example, that are required to grow these to grow these seeds? And they're concerned about the loss of control of their food supply. We talked about food sovereignty. What will happen? Will they be able to control what they eat and how it's produced? Um, one question, if these, if these seeds aren't drought resistant, for example, in countries you know, like India that can be subject to drought, um, and they require intensive inputs, then the seeds replicate and exacerbate the existing problems of monocultures, and existing to adding problems regarding uh, problems of ownership and patents, for example. And so one persistent critique of these seeds is that such seeds have not been designed or adapted to specific, um, to specific conditions and locations. They simply can't. It would be cost effective for companies like Monsanto to adapt them to specific climates. They have to be kind of a one-size-fits-all. So while these concerns about control, exploitation, and, um, and entitlement to resources affect anyone who eats, they have the greatest effect on marginalized people who pay the greatest social costs and reap the fewest benefits from expensive technologies. Um, so these groups reflect uh, concerns and criticism. We heard some of this from, say, Anita this week about gender. They reflect anthropologist Ruth Mines and Dick's um, assertion that until recently, until recently, most agricultural research has focused on increasing yield of staple foods rather than poverty alleviation. And Ruth Mines and Dick is with one of those alphabet soup, SIGAR, which stands for consultative group on, on international agricultural research. Um, but what her point is that in assessing some of these new technologies, new agricultural technologies and practices, she advocates a livelihoods approach that includes dimensions such as vulnerability, risk, social status, and gender that go beyond quantitative economic measures. So instead of looking broadly at, let's say, the food in a particular region, do a microanalysis and look at how that food and the technologies are allocated within a household. So for example, in terms looking at it in terms of how much food do women get and also breaking that down even further in, into age. So what's the difference between the young bride coming into the family, young girls, versus say the grandma who might be doing quite a bit of work. So you do a microanalysis of how do these technologies fit you know, individuals within households across, across larger categories. So these, these newer evaluative frameworks, thinking more about livelihood, for example, they include disaggregating regional and house, household ac um, access to food, technology, and money. So do men gain sole access to the new technologies and cash at the expense of women who might retain local knowledge about species and intercropping methods, for example? Food democracy and social justice asking who benefits and who loses it provides a set of criteria to guide use and development of, of technologies that don't either see judgment to a narrative of inevitability in technological process. So for example, many people look at things like GMOs as, well, it's inevitable. It's the only way to do things. If we question them, we can sort of rest the narrative back and ask some deeper questions about them. Or on the other hand, we don't necessarily want to surrender to dystopic scenarios of monsters and wild genes that, that render consideration and really good question of these technologies impossible. So the slide comes back to this. I'm looking at, if this is your main framework or criteria, we'll never even be able to ask serious questions of, of uh, see, the possibilities of GMO. 
And just this week since I was here, the issue of GMO came up in, in some ways somewhat personal to me because in Florida, where we live, Kevin and I have a whole bunch of orange trees in our backyard, and there's a, a, a disease in Florida with a number of with, with citrus. And one of the articles that came out, in, I think it was on Sunday in the New York Times, was there's there's a new gene t genetic technology to help deal with this to, to deal with this problem, and will people will people accept that? And I didn't really get it because I was here trying to get attention. I didn't really get to this whole article, but it's going to be a big issue and debate for us in Florida, um, particularly super farmers. What do, what do we do with this information? Is it the only way, or is it simply a way? I don't know all the answers, but it certainly brought the GMO issue home to me in a way that I hadn't thought of because. We like having our citrus trees in our, our backyard. I like being able to go outside and pick them every day for uh, for for lunch. Um, okay, back to the Okay, so acceptance of limits. Here's where it gets tough. This is Mark. Oh yes, I shot before I am. So I'm not a big shot. Um, so my third and final point: the idea of limits. This might be the most difficult for all of us in the United States. We are a nation of consumers, and our institutions, whether they're retail or government, will go to great lengths that we Americans continue to uh, consume food, fuel, and other resources. What, what was our advice given to us after 9-11? Go shopping, that's what George Bush said to us. Go shopping. If we don't, you know, basically, if we don't keep our American way of life, which means buy trucks, use fuel, Buy stuff, then the terrorists win. There's no, you know, there's no hard getting back to, you know, um, say, reducing our reducing our uses, so we wouldn't be so um, dependent on foreign oil. And the answer is go shopping, buy, buy, buy. Um, now, historically, values such as thrift have helped early generations navigate the Depression and World War II. My father often talks about the value of thrift that he had when he was a, a young boy during World War II. And while I think it was probably made up to keep you know, made up for the benefit of my brother and myself. It was certainly true at the same time. Um, today, a lot of people in the United States are starting to experiment with things like voluntary simplicity, but I would say for the most part, they're kind of swimming upstream. And so now, as we saw last night, we waste, waste food at unprecedented levels of all, uh, all levels of food production. And so, just to you know, give a few examples, I won't go much into this, we heard about last night. Remember our images of the supermarkets, um, sushi trays full of, you know, still full at midnight because our grocery stores don't want to give the, uh, the, um, the illusion of scarcity. I mean, I think probably a lot of us remember the images of Soviet shopping in Soviet Russia as children when the old thing was, well, they have to wait in line and, you know, forever and ever to get you know, two left shoes or something. But we want to project the, the, uh, the illusion of abundance, not, not scarcity. So we, we can't throw, we, have, we can't ever have empty trays of sushi regardless of who's going to eat it at midnight. And basically a bunch of junk college students are the only people who touch that stuff at that point. Um, and when I uh, volunteered recently at the, the Church Brook Catholic Worker House in um, Kansas City, they routinely make entire meals feeding large groups of people out of basically dings and dents, produce that is basically seen as inedible because maybe a little bit is uh, a little bit is um, kind of not not moldy, but just you know, not not looking quite as good as you might hope. So we're in there and we're looking at these these bins of or these you know, plastic. These plastic trays we all get of spinach or whatever other kind of salad mix, and they've been thrown away because it's not useful anymore. Maybe one or two leaves out of the entire thing is, is not useful. So we make we were making meals that we're feeding you know, 30, 40 people out of this. So and, and some of the college students that come through through this and their volunteer program are just amazed. They look at they look at what's there and they think we can't possibly make anything out of this, and they leave totally blown away that. Wow, we were about to throw away what just fed easily 50 people a really good, healthy and nutritious, uh, healthy and nutritious meal. So it, there's, there's a lot of, you know, just to create it, lots of, lots of stuff thrown out. So the reality is that if we want to feed the world in a just and sustainable manner, we in the global north will have to reconsider um, how we both eat our food and how we produce our food at the large scale on the policy level, not just as individuals. And I just want to point out, while we in the North, it's incumbent upon us to rethink what we do, I don't think the same criteria automatically applies to people in the 
global south. Tom, um, Thomas Friedman, who I often disagree with violently, he did make a good point in his book, The, the Hot, Flat, Crowded Earth, or whatever that thing is, basically saying that while we in the global north have to cut back, many people in the global south will need to scale up their use of consumption. So um, they, we need to cut back. I'm not going to tell someone in a poor country that they have to eat less. Um, so it's us, you know, this is, this is on us. I'm talking about us, not necessarily people in other, in, in the global south. Um, this, and similarly, if we don't produce our food sustainably, um, the poor and marginalized will suffer further because they'll have less less access to arable land and water, um, which are increasingly scarce resources. We've heard about that for the last couple of days, and it, um, in, in addition to discussion of land grabs. And so I'll just say that religion has had some words for the kind of practices that we've had with our entitlements toward, towards resources. You guys have all heard these words, greed, desire, gluttony. Um, but religion also offers us some tools, self-restraint and self-discipline, for example. So I'm going to return for a moment just to the Buddhist tradition to discuss consumption, desire, and happiness. And I'm going to draw on economist E.F. Schumacher's Buddhist economics. And so he says, the purpose of modern economics is consumption, and higher consumption leads to greater happiness. The assumption that you know, the more we buy, the more we use, that's going to make us happier and happier. Um, Buddhist economics, on the other hand, is based on simplicity and nonviolence. Why simplicity? Endless variation and novelty, for example, can lead us to crave more and more. And these foods and goods don't make us happy because we can never have enough. For example, we can eat every just one potato chip. And they eat all those Doritos. I mean, every time we think we're bored of Doritos, they pull out another flavor and it lures us back to that Dorito aisle. And speaking from experience, I know this is true. <laughs> And the New York Times uh, magazine recently had ran an article that described how scientists and food companies are designing flavors and products so they become addicted to junk food. So the bliss point we heard about earlier, the, the, discipline, the, the bliss point, they're creating food so we really can't stop. We're essentially becoming addicts. And yogurt, so this, this uh, yogurt here, which I've never actually had, but it really looks disgusting. <laughs> but yogurt, we don't a lot of us have been eating what looks like relatively healthy yogurt and really enjoying it on top of our fruit. Um, but look at that. So we've basically taken yogurt, which is generally seen as a primarily a healthy food, it's now a dessert. And these things have twice as much sugar as Lucky Charms. I don't know when the last time you hear it, Lucky Charms, but there's a lot of sugar in this stuff. Um, and so, you know, let's let's think about what we're doing here. In a time of rampant obesity, we've added sugar to a food that should need minimal processing. And even further, most sugar, this is kind of a side note here, most sugar production, at least in even Florida and much of the Caribbean, is done under extremely oppressive, almost near slavery conditions. So basically, to our nice healthy food, we basically added a spoonful of slavery. How good is that? So can we, can we learn to be satisfied by plainer and simpler food, perhaps even seasonal produce and foods lower on the food chain? And that leads me into the next thing of meat. Should we eat meat? And Mark had a fabulous poster up, so if you haven't looked at it yet, you should look at that um, to address the issue of meat. Um, and, and it's an interesting issue for us in the US. Um, at, for many people in the United States, eating meat, especially beef, is part of being an American. That's um, sometimes the idea of being vegetarian is seen as an affront to our cultural identity. And I've even seen things where vegetarianism is almost like put in the same paragraph or linkage as like um, yoga, vegetarianism, Satanism. <laughs> I, I have seen that many times in religion for us. You wouldn't believe the kind of things that we, uh, that we see. Um, so I suffice to say that you know, meat, hot dogs, hamburgers, it's a, it's a large part of the cultural identity for many Americans. And the, the, the suggestion to change that is a really difficult thing for many people to uh, take. But um, meat production, and I'm primarily talking about factory farm meat production, it carries enormous environmental, health, and social costs. And it's also responsible for unspeakable animal suffering. And we are complicit in that. And Thich Nhat Hanh writes that, um, he says, by eating meat, we share the responsibility for climate change, the destruction of our forests, and the poisoning of air, air and water. The simple act of becoming a vegetarian will make a difference in the health of our planet. He does not, imagine, he does not talk at all in that quotation about the suffering animals, but that's certainly, uh, certainly in that. 
And so if you want to get some more information, first look at Mark's poster and also there's a report that came out which he cites, Livestock to Wakashata, which gives in great detail the, the horrible environmental impacts of the current meat production. Um, now, however, on the other hand, um, of the 800 million, 880 million rural, rural poor people that live on less than a dollar a day, 70% are partially or completely dependent on livestock for their livelihood and food security. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean eating those animals, but it does mean that in many cultures, animals have, um, animals have a large role in livelihood. So, for example, animal traction or um, sheep, uh, sheep dogs, dogs that are, uh, dogs that are, are working dogs. So they're not necessarily eating them, but the animals have a large role to play in all aspects of rural livelihoods, including, including um, fertilization.